Hi, everyone. Welcome to Craft Authors in Conversation. I'm Denise Kiernan. I am delighted to be here tonight with Molly Asher. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, for those of you who have not been uh, with us on craft before, I will tell you a little bit about what it is. This conversation series used to take place live at the lovely Little Jumbo Cocktail Bar here in Asheville, North Carolina. We had conversation. We had specialty cocktails inspired by our guests. Malaprops, the amazing independent bookstore, sold books in the back. It was a lovely affair. Then COVID happened. And we thought we wouldn't do it anymore. But then we said, no, we're going to keep doing it. So here we are uh, doing it on the Crowdcast. And luckily for me, that has actually meant that I get to talk to folks who aren't necessarily in Asheville at the time, like Molly, who is coming to us from New York City. Um, so I am still thrilled that we have Malaprops as our, our sponsor. And if you see that button down at the bottom of your screen, order books from Malaprops, I highly encourage you to do so, uh, or from your local independent bookstore. And we also still have Little Jumbo playing along. Uh, the mixologist and co-owner of Little Jumbo, Shaw Gray, always creates a special cocktail for whoever the guest is. And he has done the same this evening for Molly. And we will see that cocktail recipe a little bit later in the hour. Um, so here's the deal. We're going to talk a little bit about work and process and movies and books. And while we do this, there is a chat on the right hand side of your screen. Feel free to chat with each other as things come up in the conversation. As always, we have Joe lurking in the background. Joe will do his best to come up with website links and, and keep things going in case people have questions. If you have an actual question that you would like to ask me or ask Molly, please click that ask a question button right down there. It keeps all the questions in the same place which makes it easy for us to make sure that we get to everybody so we don't have to kind of track the chat while everything is going on. Um, I will be sending out a recap after this, and we will go over in that recap some of the things that came up in the conversation. And uh, that's about it. Welcome, Molly. Hi. Nice Hi. to be here. Thanks for coming. Um, you know, uh, for, first of all, congratulations, Nomad Land winning the Academy Award. I mean, one of many, many, many uh, <laughs> awards that the film has won. That must be just, I, I just, I'm so, so very happy for you. Thank and you. It's such a wonderful film. Um, there are several films that always come to mind for me when I think about producers. Mm. So one is a uh, classic indie film, Swingers. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a scene where John Favreau and Vince Vaughn are trying to impress some women they've met in Vegas. And they ask John Favreau what he does. And he's a comedian and he's trying to explain what he's doing. And, and there's, they say, well, where do you perform? Oh, well, I'm in LA. Well, where do you perform out there? Oh, well, I don't have West Coast representation yet. Well, who was your East Coast representation? And he's just fumbling and fumbling and trying to come up with all these answers. Then they turn to Vince Vaughn and they say, well, what do you do? And he goes, I'm a producer. And they go, oh, yeah. <laughs> the other film that I love when it comes to producing is uh, David Mamet's State and Maine, mm -hmm. which is hilarious. And there's a great scene in there, and it's centered around the wonderful uh, Philip, Philip Seymour Hoffman, who plays the writer, who has come from theater and is, is now working in the movies. And he asks one of the people on the crew, what is an associate producer credit? And he says, it's what you give your secretary instead of a raise. <laughs> That's my other favorite thing. But I don't know. And if anybody has a suggestion, please put it in the, uh, in the, in the chat. One of my favorite films when it comes to producers is the film Wag the Dog. Mm -hmm. Did you see Wag the Dog? I don't it remember. I remember it, it was but a while ago. Yeah. yeah. I don't I don't think I, I did. So. so basically, uh Robert De Niro is a fixer. And in order to avoid a very bad scandal eleven days before an election. Uh, Robert De Niro hires Dustin Hoffman, who's a Hollywood producer, to produce the appearance of a war to distract the American people from what's going on. And throughout this film, Dustin Hoffman, all he all he keeps saying is, whenever anything goes wrong, this is nothing. This is nothing. 
we were four months into the Song of Solomon. We didn't have the rights. This is nothing, you know. And he just keeps going on and on and on and on. And he always says, they don't understand what we do. They don't understand what we do. Molly, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I think it's, I, people have, I think people have this feeling about directors and writers. Yeah. And, and how do you, when somebody's like, what do you do? What do you, what, what do you, how do you even begin to explain to people all the different ways in which you're involved in the development, production and post-production of a film? Well, I usually start by saying that I teach producing and it takes 14 weeks to answer that question. <laughs> 14 weeks of three hour classes. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, a producer is their kind of the engine of a project. And so um, there are different types of producers, but the kind of producer I am, um, I'm someone that's there from through every single phase of the production from development to pre-production to production to post-production to release of the movie and um so that can be the development can be like getting the rights to a book and then hiring a writer to adapt it or it can be um working on a script with a a, a writer that are you know like a filmmaker comes to you with a script and developing that more um it's also the your financing, your casting, and then pre-production is when you're putting together your team and your 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 creative collaborators, um, and you know making sure that film is going to be set up with unions and all of those things. And then production is overseeing all of that, being there for your for the director by the monitor, making sure that their vision that you understood during development is is being executed in every single capacity in every single department and then in post production it's um again making sure that the vision is 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 being is continuing uh through the edit process finding the right composer the sound designer making it all a cohesive whole and then you know all the way through to um distribution finding the right partner to get it out there into the world um so yeah a producer is uh makes i think magic happen makes nothing out of something i mean makes something out of nothing <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned um you mentioned creative collaborators and uh you worked with chloe zhao on nomad land that was not the first time you guys worked together you guys met at nyu as students right. mm -hmm. um a while ago did you what kind of drew the two of you to each other as students and when did you guys realize you know we let's make a movie you know mm -hmm. yeah um well we became friends first we were we were the ones that would close <laughs> sh shut down the apple bar near near school so we we liked to <laughs> hang out together and that's always a good collaboration start to a good collaboration is, is friendship um we we ha both loved Wong Kar Wai um, so we like had some similar, you know, aesthetics and, um, and then she asked me to work on her feature that she had, that she had written. And, um, we hadn't actually worked together before. I hadn't, I hadn't actually produced any of her shorts. Um, but we right away just connected in the way that we worked, the way that we work. We're both people who don't take no for an answer. We'll find a way to make something happen if you have to like bang down the doors. <laughs> did you ever, um, did you ever think about while you were at school, um, did you do any, any writing yourself? Did you ever think about writing and directing or do you still think about writing and directing? Yeah, definitely. I mean, as a young person, I wrote, I wrote like short stories and poetry. And so going to school, that was the first time that I ever tried screenwriting. Um, and, and I, and the school that we went to at NYU, you, you learn every aspect. So I was learning directing, cinematography, editing, um, writing, directing. And, um, and I found that I really do love directing. I found that I did not like the process of screenwriting. I like working with screenwriters, but, uh, the process for me was very like opposite of what I needed to, how I needed to be, to be a producer. Uh, so it took me to like a very quiet, uh, solitary, solitary place. And I felt yeah. it was hard to, to, um, balance that 
self with the what do you have to be as a producer so um but i do i would in the future like to eventually direct something somebody else's script you know it's easy to it's easy to look at sort of where someone is in the present you know having just won an academy award um <laughs> and 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 forget that things were not always always so easy. So when you guys worked on um, Songs My Brother Taught Me, mm -hmm. uh, you lost your financing, correct? That is true, yes. And and, Dust, and Dustin Hoffman would have said, this is nothing. You know, <laughs> <laughs> um, talk about what that was, because that was early on in your career. That was early on in your collaborative co career as well, the two of you. Um, what was it like, like, how did that unfold that moment, unpack that a little bit for me, how you found out and was there ever a discussion about like, oh, well, you know, should we pack it in, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it was really, really tough to put money together for that film. Um, first of all, because it was early in our careers and we didn't have connections to financing. Um, and so, you know, we were a lot of, we were getting a lot of grants and things like that, crowdfunding, because that was, we didn't know people, but it was also it was a tough film to pitch. Um, people saw they were, they thought that there wouldn't be an audience, and we that that was oh, always. Oh, I'm sorry. The, tell if you could tell everybody just a little oh, bit about the film yes. before we. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's, yeah, uh, it's set on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, and it's about a young Lakota boy, um, teenager who. I guess he's more like 18 and he is um he wants to move out to the west coast with his girlfriend um but he has to make a choice of whether he's going to leave his home and everything he knows there and his sister um to pursue his this dream of moving away or if he'll stay home um with with his family which is a, a common um conundrum that uh chloe discovered a lot of people on on the reservation in particular will will come across and have that so um so it didn't necessarily like the pitch i still pitch it poorly it didn't necessarily come, come across like it was going to be like a you know uh a block was there a car chase was there a car chase <laughs> no but there is a there is a, a truck does get blown up <laughs> see you should have you should have led with that yes yes <laughs> <laughs> but so yeah so we were fine we were eventually introduced to um forest whitaker's company significant productions and um and they right away saw something special in 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 chloe and in like the the access that we had you know the relationships that we built on the reservation um and so they wanted to put money into the film and um to finance it and so at some point they said you know go go out to the reservation start the prep you know um and what the money is coming the money didn't come and we were out there we already our production designer was buying props set dressing like we were about to bring out our assistant director and then we get a phone call that um that the money is not coming um they the money was supposed to be coming in from another film that was being delayed and so we had to send everybody home which was awful i mean we had i mean we had been years putting this thing together and then finding the right people and all the logistics of shooting on the reservation send everybody home people had like sublet their apartments it was very sad and then they said like can you and so can you do it in the fall and then can you push it another month and then it was like i remember i got a call from chloe and she was like how much money do we have in the bank and uh, like can we make it with that and i was like let's do it like we are going to make this movie and um we've worked so hard like we'll find a way and so with that decision um she said you know i'm gonna i want to i'm gonna throw away the script but i'm gonna keep the narrative we're gonna let though the people in the place kind of tell our story we're gonna pare down the crew to like a dock size crew so there was nine of us and you know we went out there and we made it happen and and i think that's also sort of where her and her dp josh uh sort of came found their voice found the kinds of the kind of way that they that they're making films and i that's i also learned then how to create the space for them to to make this these strange types of movies <laughs> that we make so it but beautiful and very intimate i mean one of the things that i liked about nomad land is it for me it felt like sweeping and massive, but it also felt very, very small and quiet and intimate, which is what I liked. And you talked about letting the people in the place tell the story. In the case of um, 
in the case of Assange, my brother um, taught me, as well as in Nomadland, you do go into communities. Um, in the case of um, you know, songs my brother taught me, you're on, you're on a reservation. Um, and a lot of these communities, you are entering people's lives. And, you know, I remember I was interviewing uh, Ray, the journalist Ray Suarez, um, you know, who's done a, a million things over the years, um, a few weeks ago. And he talked about the challenges of what he called parachuting into someone's life and knowing that you're not going to be there. How do you begin to navigate something like that? Because you have to, I would imagine, gain the trust of people who have no idea who you are, whether or not you're going to be having like car chases or explosions. Like, what are you doing with this film? How do, how do you even start to do that? Yeah, um, well, it's part. It's one of my favorite things I like to do with what, what, why one of my favorite things working with Chloe that I like to do is going into these communities that are not my own and meeting people that I wouldn't normally have met. Um, and we go in like very just open hearted, like we are there to, um, you know, hear people's stories, share our share ours too. You know, there's a lot of like the trust that we're building is because we're also giving of ourselves too and um, becoming becoming friends, you know, and lifelong friends ends up being. Um, but, uh, and and it's, it's a process, you know, um, a lot of it also begins with Chloe and the way that she's able to, um, she really draws a lot out of people. Like it's amazing at the end of a conversation with her, how much she can, she can get you to reveal <laughs> about yourself. And, um, and it, and so, just this this mutual respect ends up uh, forming, and I think that that's that's how we go about um, working with non actors and and in in places that are not our own. Does it? It's it's a it's actually a very big um, it's a big responsibility. I would imagine if you're encouraging that kind of um, storytelling, there's a lot that goes on that is unscripted. Is that a fair assumption? In songs, yes. Um, she then learned like we can't not go into a project with a script because <laughs> uh, it t then took like it took forever to to cut that movie because she had to write it in the edit. Um, but what she does for her for so we did do go in though like with the writer we went in with like a scriptment which was like it was like uh, I think it was like around fifty pages of the script. Um, then Nomadland was was a script, but it had it was created by Chloe will meet with 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 people and they'll share their stories and then she'll fo fold that into the script in you know specific places narratively where they will be the most dramatic for what the the story is that she's telling. So then and then when we're on set, you know, she'll say like, "Hey, Swanky, tell me about the story of when you went kayaking and and you saw the swallows." And so Swanky is then telling a story that she's told Chloe, that Chloe has written in the script, but she's not like reading it from the script. She's telling her story. Got it. Um, how much of that is actually, so how much do things sort of change actually live during production with regard to, do you ever get stories out of people you were not expecting whatsoever? Did that happen during this film, during Nomadland? Um, well, something that happened during Nomadland was she met with Bob Wells, who's sort of the like the guru of um, nomads, and um, and prior to shooting, but we were we were shooting, but she met with him like on one evening or something, and and he started to tell tell her stories, and that's when he shared the story about his son. Um, and have has everyone seen the film? I won't say what in case people. Oh I yeah, maybe not. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Maybe so not, but, so he yeah. he shares a story with her about her about his son and then um she heard that and she was like she she knew that that was going to be something very important to fold into the script so it wasn't there previously um so while we were shooting she, you know we weren't literally shooting it was time off so then that night she wrote she she wrote a scene um that then is in the movie where he shares this story with the uh, Francis McDormand's character so that's something where it was like a discovery while we were shooting in a way um but but she did do it in the she did write it into a scene. There were some some scenes where that didn't actually make it into the film, where she, somebody might have been telling a story that uh, we didn't know they were going to tell. Um, but like the story 
the stories that the people say around the fire, um, those were stories that she had already her she, she picked those specific people because she went and talked to all the different nomads learned a little bit about like how they became a nomad and then she specifically chose those people for the stories that they would tell when you're using real real people and you know non-actor people alongside francis mcdormand i mean how do you uh, as a uh, as a during the production, how do you sort of manage, those are two very different groups that you're, you're dealing with. Um, how do you, how do you go about, how do you go about casting uh, for real people who are going to have acting roles in a major motion picture alongside major motion picture actors? How mm -hmm. do you, how does that casting, what does that casting process look like for you? Um, well, we do kind of a three, threefold sort of casting. So we'll do uh, big open calls in the locations and we'll have people come in and tell us stories, tell us a story from their life, you know, tell us, tell us like a, something funny that happened to you or, you know, or I don't know, we just get them talking. So then, so we're getting, so we're seeing how uh, comfortable they are telling a story in front of a camera, we'll, we'll record it. Then there we'll also do um, street casting. So we had, um, uh, someone go out to, for example, in the film, there's a young traveler um, who originally was actually written in the script as a young woman that that Fern meets. But um, we sent out this street casting director to go and find these travelers. They're like a little bit different from nomads. And so she went into the communities where those people would be and she starts to get to know them. She tells them what we're doing, that she's we're, we're making a film. And so she records people talking and Chloe ended up really falling in love with this one, one young man and put him then in the film. So there's that street casting part where we're, she saw just like something magnetic about him. And that's why she changed the role to be for him. And then the other way that we're casting is like through community, like, the community building. So like I, I'm going to, I'm, I'm seeing well, who's, who's in the book, you know, so obviously like Swanky and Linda May were in the book and Bob. And so it was automatic that, that we were gonna want them in it. Whether they were gonna be like good or not is always a, a risk that you'll have to take. But I think Chloe knows how to, um, how to make people comfortable and, and um, she knows how to cut also edit so that um, performances. And and also the, the the intimacy that on set it's like people they I, I still am amazed though some of these people these people who have never trained before and can do like what actors train all their lives to do you know, um, but I think yeah there's there's they're seeing something though they're seeing a, a, a comfort in one's own self that's um, that you can see when you're casting non actors. You you mentioned the book Nomadland was was a book. Um, a, a lot of writers uh, hope for their material to be optioned and turned into a film. Um, but you, it's also a big responsibility to adapt someone's work uh, from a book in, into a film. And obviously it's so much, and this is true about writing as well as filmmaking. A lot of times it's not what you keep in, it's what you leave out. Mm. Were there, any particular things that come to mind where you think you know, where, where it was kind of hard to think about you know what had to essentially stay not even on the cutting room floor it wasn't even shot like you knew going in you know we can't go down that road um were those decisions um group decisions uh was chloe really kind of focused on that before you guys you know went into production that's a it's a it's a big challenge to adapt something like that yeah, yeah. I mean, and originally, um, when Peter Spears, one of the producers on the project in Francis McDormand, they they got the rights to the book. And they originally, when they approached Chloe, thought she was going to do a more clear adaptation where Francis would play the role of Linda May, because in the book, that's like the clearest narrative arc. And then Chloe said, no, actually, I would like to try to make it in the way that I have made my movies, where Linda May plays Linda May, and then I create a character for Francis to play, who would be meeting these people along the way, um, and so, so that so that right away was something that wasn't in the book. The character that Francis plays was completely created, um, but right, the book has has a, a more of a political social agenda in a way. It's talking about like the the, the 
the issues in our country of uh, gig working. And, um, mm -hmm. and so the way that Chloe has always made her movies um, is she doesn't go, she doesn't like to go in with an agenda. She likes to though present the world and you can gather from it what you want. And so that was a, a specific thing that she was going to leave out uh, from, from the book. Um, and I, and I think in that sense, we get to, she does end up saying some things that you read in the book, but it's just said in a different way. It's said in her voice. Um, I think that answers your question of like what we didn't include from the book. <laughs> it's a, well, it's, I mean, it's, it's always, um, interesting to start with a complete package of a sort and take a lot of the things that are in there and repackage it in a very different way. And one of the things that I think is true about Nomadland is that it is very relatable. Um, and was that relatability, there's, there is a real sort of, there isn't an agenda in the movie. And um, was that something that was talked about? Uh, Cause it definitely sort of comes across as, for me anyway, you were, you were just watching these people's, there's no judgment to it. There's no statement about it. You're just kind of a part of these people's lives for a couple hours. Um, was that something that was discussed a lot? Um, it was discussed, but not a lot because it was also understood that that's how Chloe makes movies. And so we knew go, getting into it that that's, that was the kind of film we were going to be making, that it was like, it was a story of this, of this one woman um, and her journey and the people that she meets along the way. Um, but so, um, yeah, it was, it, it was, a, it was understood from the, from the, from the beginning. What draws, um, cause you've worked with, uh, true stories before, and you've ob obviously worked with um, real life non-actor people before, what draws you personally to a story? Like what, what draws you to a story that makes you think this will not just work on the page or work, you know, telling, telling a story around a campfire, this will actually work on a big screen? Um, well, I always come at things from the f uh, filmmaker first, so even before story, actually, um, which goes, you know, goes all the way back to songs because we kind of threw out the the story. Uh, well, I guess we kept the story. We're keeping the narrative, but like what we were trying to say. But um, but yeah, so I'm I'm coming into things first by like, oh, this is an exciting filmmaker, an interesting per person. The way they see the world, the way they express what they see, um, and then, but. Um, but when I'm connecting to a story, it's because I am seeing some, I, I'm connecting, I'm seeing some part of myself also in, in the story. I'm relating and feeling like I'm communicating with the, the filmmaker, whoever wrote it. Um, and, and, and then ultimately, like, I'll feel then that other people will, will relate as well. It's, to me, it's filmmaking is about communication and, you know, it's, creating discussion and so i'm always attracted to projects that are going to going to create some sort of discourse when you um when anybody starts a creative project whether it's a book or a film or whatever a lot of time the conception of that project happens at one point and the execution of that project happens at another point and then the release of that project whether it's a book being published or a film being you know released happens at another point in time. Um, certainly we were not in the middle of a global pandemic when you started conceiving of this film. Um, how, how do you think that, had you known that your film was going to be released into this particular world, um, do you think that would have affected the way that you guys Hmm. did it because it, it it resonated tremendously with people in the middle of what's all this craziness that's right. been going on but i mean you really as a creator you have no idea the world in which your stuff is going to land it's always very different than the world in which you created it yeah um so i mean talk about that how the world changed between the time you guys were like let's make this movie and oh my god there's a pandemic mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, there it did still feel like there was something pre pre prescient about it uh, before we made the before we made the film before and while we were making it before the pandemic. Um, you know, I very much the 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 whole idea of like people losing what the, what they thought that you know after the financial crisis losing like my parents lost a lot of what they their retirement you know they they imagined they were going to travel all over the world and then and then we're not able to do that and and so um and i i think then that just like you know was amplified then when the pandemic happened but um so i think it was always going to be something that people would understand and relate to um and it's you know it's interesting because like it was actually frustrating after we we shot the film in, in 2018 and then chloe got this marvel movie and so we had to put it on hold for her to go and shoot that and then she was supposed to come back and start editing that but on and ours and then the pandemic happened and so they shut down the marvel movie which was sort of a blessing for us because then we had her entirely to ourselves <laughs> during this time to edit the film um and i think yeah i think it 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 didn't it didn't change, I think, the story that she wanted to tell. Um, but, but yeah, I remember, I'll never forget seeing one of the first cuts was like sort of toward the beginning of the lockdown. And I just, I just went into the bathroom and bawled for like two hours. I, it made me just, I just, I couldn't, I just thought about my parents because they're the age of these people. And I was just, you know, God, like, what if, you know, God forbid, if something happened and I can't go be with them, like it was just, it really, I think for all of us was a, yeah, was a, it was an interesting experience to be able to work on that during, during the pandemic. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm glad that in a way, I'm glad that it was, it came out during this time because I feel like it's something, it, it feel, felt healing in a way, like it felt healing while we were making it um, during the pandemic, the editing. And I feel like it, it was that, that for people as well. There's a, I'm, there's an incredible um, there's an incredible relatability about it, and there's such there's such an intimacy to it that I think actually lent itself to the experience that a lot of us have been have been having the past year, and kind of threw into sharp relief a lot of the experiences that we all of us in our own individual lockdowns have been have been kind of going through. Um, the uh, you know when you when you go to look for your next when you go to look for your next projects we have people who you know watch this who are writers people who want to be writers people who are, want to go to film school mm -hmm. um do you just sort of like cast around and and follow your curiosity or are you the kind of person who is saying i've always wanted to do a film about blank mm. You know no, I, mean? I follow my curiosity, I guess. And I, I, uh, and I, I seek out, number one, I'm seeking out filmmakers and the stories they want to tell. And then, and that, and that, cause that's it, what excites me. Um, but I also now am looking more at looking for material that then, and then finding a, like a, like a book to adapt and then finding the right filmmaker to, to adapt that, that story. But, um, but, but I have such a wide range of what, interests me um like i like i there's not like a specific genre or anything there's not uh something like burning the story that i have to tell uh it's just more of like a story that draws me in and um that makes me curious i think curiosity is such an important part of um filmmaking for me because it's such a long process you have to you have so you have to you can't just be like passionate about it you have to like be truly curious so it can sustain you over the many years <laughs> no it's true it's the same it's it's the same with books they're mm -hmm. in your they're in your lives for so long when you're researching them and writing them and then having to go out and promote them and talk about them like you still believe in them mm -hmm. um you know the the curious you still have to have that curiosity about the material that kind of pulls you forward um what do you can you talk about what you're working on now? Well, I have a film coming out. Uh, it's going to be in Tribeca called Catch the Fair One. And it's um, uh, like an action thriller about a former champion boxer played by a real boxer who's um, 
uh, her sister goes missing and she uh, goes in search of her and ends up uncovering a sex trafficking ring. Um, and it's, it's the, the, the boxer is Native American. So it's speaking to the issue of missing and murdered indigenous women, but it's done in a, it's wrapped up in a, like, like a, a, a thrilling ride of a movie. Um, my parents actually watched it and said that it was their favorite of my movies, like even more than Nomadland. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, when is that when is that going to be out uh june 13th is its premiere at tribeca and then we'll, and then we're okay. we're looking for a, a distributor that's fantastic now you do you mentioned earlier um you do teach producing mm -hmm. um what advice would you give somebody who's watching who i mean uh, about producing their about independent film and the state mm -hmm. of independent film today and trying to go out and do your own thing. Because I think now more than 10 years ago, certainly more than 20 years ago, the the tech not people are shooting things on their iPhones, they're editing stuff on their computers. Um, there does seem to be the ability to do more on your own, but it's also not as simple as just doing it on your own. And because and, you can throw a lot of spaghetti at the wall and you know you don't know if somebody's gonna see your spaghetti. Mm -hmm. So, um, what, what do you, what do you tell folks who want to, um, your students who want to get into this? Yeah. I really encourage them to, to really be active in the film community. Um, you know, embrace like, like stay, staying in contact with their, their classmates, you know, building a, a like, a, um, extending their network, you know, getting involved in the local like nonprofits that that um, support filmmakers, um, volunteer, you know, for these organizations, continue learning, continue, because I think one of the biggest challenges with independent filmmaking is actually like sustainability. And, um, and a lot of the like jobs that you will get are are through other filmmakers. And, and then also, you know, they'll work on your films, you might work on theirs. It's just, I, I think it's it's impossible to make independent film without that community. Um, and it also like keeps you, you know, comforts you when you're, that people will comfort you when you're down and celebrate with you when you're up. It's, it, that's, that's I think the number one. And then also to not wait for permission. You know, like we, with Songs My Brothers Taught Me, we were not, we decided like, we're not gonna just sit there and wait again for, that for people to come and say like, here's the money. We're just gonna go and figure out how to make it happen. I can imagine that was a very, um, you already knew each other for a while, but I imagine that really kind of forged the working relationship between uh, you and Chloe Zhao, yes? Definitely, yeah, yeah. If mm -hmm. you can get through that. Um, okay, geeky, nerdy stuff. Do you have any, uh, favorite uh favorite work rituals do you have a time of day that you like to work specifically creatively um do you get into any of those sorts of do you have any kind of habits favorite mm. softwares yeah favorite little working little little hacks that you like <laughs> i like to wake up early and that's when I do my reading of scripts when it's quiet and like the world hasn't woken up yet. But I do more of my like creative thinking at in the evening um, after I've had my day of like the work stuff. Um, I wish I had more fun little ritual things. I'm a huge note taker. Oh. I just, I like, I love, I love checking things off my to-do list. <laughs> and do I- Do you ever I, do, this is, Go ahead, go ahead. Well, I like to um, rewrite my to-do list, like per, like I'll begin the week and have, and, and start, even if it is I'm repeating from something that was from last week, but I like to start a new page where I'm writing my to-dos for that, that week. <laughs> you, are you a bullet journaler? Yeah, yeah. Is that, if that, I think I understand what you mean, yeah. Yes, so I, so you do your to-do list by hand? Yes. Yeah. I used to do it on, on the computer, but I just found that like, I was, I wasn't always, I, I like the act of actually being able to cross it out. Do you ever, if you did something that wasn't on your list, do you write it on your <laughs> list just for the joy of checking it off? 
I do. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> I want credit for it, so I write it in and check it right. off anyway. Right, and I'll sometimes write things that are like really easy to do so that I can check it off. <laughs> <laughs> Laundry. Manage the, Done. manage the expectations, yes. Water and plants. <laughs> yes. Woo! Um, it's amazing. I find it, um, and I could go into this forever, but I find as much as computers are a big part of my life, writing by hand for me is huge. And I think it actually allows my, 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 my mind works at the correct speed in coordination with what my body is doing. And there is something about if you don't finish your to do's having to rewrite them again, that's a whole, that really kind of, you either like, well, okay, why didn't I do that? Or mm -hmm. maybe I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. you know, or maybe I don't really need to do that. And that kind of constant, um, handwriting, I find, I, I always, I always do all my, I do all my to do's by hand and it's, it yeah. takes a long time sometimes. It does. And it is interesting. Yeah. There'll be like things that I keep week to week to week, re continuing to write this one thing. And I'm like, yeah, there are times that I'm like, why is it that I'm not doing this? Is this actually, yeah. is this a project that I want to continue to pursue? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Um, I, yeah, I could go journaling could be a whole other Journaling could be a whole other discussion. Um, okay, so before we get to questions, it's time for Molly's cocktail. Mm, I'm so excited. So, let's see what Molly's cocktail is. Once again, this is brought to us by Shaw Gray, co-owner and mixologist from Little Jumbo. And loading, loading, loading. Share screen, please. Okay. I am screen sharing. No, I didn't want to share all that. Hold on. Sorry, one moment. Okay. This usually works a lot easier. I can usually share my, see, I got you all excited. <laughs> and I have it loaded up. Talk amongst yourselves while I'm doing this spaghetti wall metaphor. Thank you. I love, see Joe's in the chat. He's under my little head, but he is in the chat. Okay. What are we saying? Yeah, that's not what I wanted to say. Okay. All right. Let me see if I can pull this up a different way. It is called the intercontinental. I will tell you that. Okay. Um, the cocktail, the cocktail is called the intercontinental and it is a, an old West coast modern classic that has a Verna and sack and Luxardo maraschino. And I'll try and bring it up again. It will be included and it's delicious. And then you mix it with ice and you strain it into a coupe glass. Oh, and I'm so excited. I, I can't manage to, I'm going to try once more to share my screen. Um, while What's, I do what that. Is, let, what is the base the, of, of Verna? Is that what you said? A Verna, which is an Amaro, which is delicious. And um, so Amaros are digestivos from Italy that are herb blends that you drink after uh, you have dinner. Okay. And then Ansac is a cognac. So it has an Amaro and a cognac and then maraschino cherry uh, Luxardo mix. And then you mix it with ice, strain it into a coupe glass. And I love coupe glasses, they're my favorite. Mm -hmm. And it is served It is served up with an orange twist. But the recipe will go out with the, uh, it will, the recipe will go out with the um, recap. And I'm gonna see right now, uh, if I could pull it up again. While I do that, I'm gonna go to one of our questions. Let's see. Uh, thank you so much for your films. I missed the writer in the, th oh, it's Dan Perry. I missed the writer in the theater and keep waiting for it to appear on one of my platforms. Any idea where I might find it? Um, I think it's the writer is on, can you, can you rent it on, you can't rent it on Amazon? Dan, have you tried renting it on Amazon? 
you may answer in the in the chat. Are you looking right now? I'm looking. Yes, you can rent it on Amazon Prime, oh. Google Play, okay. Apple TV, YouTube, and Vudu. All right. Hook it up. Yay. All right. <laughs> um, thank you, Dan. Hi, Dan. Um, from the West Coast. All right. Uh, another question we have, what is the hardest, the hardest thing to teach your students about producing? Hmm. Gosh. Mm-hmm. Like the thing that the that they have the hardest time grasping. The uh, the thing the hardest thing to get across is how I'm in I'm interpreting that, but um if you want to clarify that question, that was from, oh, that was from Joe. Um, if you want to clarify that question, that would be great. But yeah, I think it's the hardest thing to teach, to get across, teaches in quotes. So I'm going to interpret teach being in quotes as the hardest yeah. thing to get across to your students. I think, um... To get across yes okay like what is a well-structured story you know like because as a producer you have to understand uh structure and screenwriting and i mm -hmm. think that the hardest thing is motivated protagonists what do they want how do they try and get it what gets in their way and what do they realize like i think that that's probably the hardest thing <laughs> to teach and get across do you ever have producers who are like, but I, I want to produce. I don't want to be a writer. I don't need to, you know, students who are like, I don't need to know that storytelling stuff. You know, tell me, tell me how to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. You, ever, you know, yeah. maybe, but I, I start out my class though. That's like one of the first, that's like the first thing that I talk about is that like, as a producer, you have to understand story because you're the one that, whether you're working with the writer, giving them notes or identifying whether a script is good, you know, like, read scripts, you know, just read scripts, read screenwriting books, you know. Um, but, you know, the, the the thing that's the hardest thing for them to get is is just a hard thing, you know. <laughs> Even though it sounds simple, once tries, realizes it's not so simple. <laughs> that's why there's so many bad scripts out there. <laughs> <laughs> and yet some of them still get made. Um... I'll never understand. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's remarkable to me. Um, do you, um, do you think the state of independent film now compared to say, like when you were going to, to film school yourself, do you think it's kind of more welcoming to, to folks or, uh, harder to get into? Do you have any feeling on that at all? Yeah. You know, I was just talking to a student and they were saying like, you know, like now with, with the industry, like being more inclusive, like, do you think that like, that, that are they looking for anything different? And and I was like, they're still looking to make money. And they're like, I'm, I'm a little bit jaded and feel like, yeah, they're being inclusive because they realize that that's how they're going to make money. You know, <laughs> um, like they, that they were leaving money on the, on the table. By the table. Not, yep. Yeah. Um, I feel like it's a little bit, it's, a, it, I worry it's a little bit tougher actually now because um, so many, because of the streamers and so many companies coming in early on projects and, and not, you know, like the, like the whole thing of like, you make a film, you take it to Sundance, you sell it to, to you know, big right. bidding war, but so many yeah. films now come already, already bought. And then they're just using the, 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 uh, festival is a launching pad, but I worry that that's going to make it so that some of these more out of the box films are not going to necessarily get paid it made because the distributors will say like, oh, we need a name or uh, that's not going to, we don't see an audience for that. So they're, so, you know, I worry that there's going to be less equity financiers taking risks um, because all these production companies coming in earlier. That's really interesting. Um, are there any um, are there any are there any stories that kind of got away from you that you sort of like were hoping to make and then 
either couldn't get the rights or uh, things didn't just come together right. I mean, because so many things have to come together, casting rights, um, mm-hmm. you know, someone like Chloe, someone like you, um, all the right. You, you talk about her, her Marvel film getting put on hold and how that actually turned out to work in your favor. I mean, so many times it does feel like, you know, capturing lightning in a bottle. Mm-hmm. Um, but are, are there some that have, have gotten away from you that you, you sort of wish you got to work on? Yeah, there's this one project. It hasn't been made yet, but um, it's going to be a first feature, and that and uh, Barry Jenkins and his company got it. And uh, but I thought it was. I think it's going to be a really beautiful film. I would have liked to have worked on it. I love to hear that. Um, it's always we all have those stories that are, you know, things that it, it's so easy to focus on what we didn't get instead of what we actually managed managed to do. But I, I still think it's good to have those things that, you know, kind of, kind of, you know, were beyond your grasp a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think she'll be, she'll be in good hands, but, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that like, if we, if I'm not doing it, that he has, that she has someone who will under, that I think will truly understand her vision. So she's, I'm, if I'm not going to do it, I'm glad that she's got, got him. <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's good. I love to see that. Um, do you ever, here's another question. Do you ever want to work with a studio? Yes. You know, well, we, we worked with Searchlight. Um, they're, you know, mini major. I like, I like the, the mini majors because they're like a little bit, you know, can be a little bit more outside of the box. Like I like, but I really liked working with them um they it's it, it's it's such a relief to not have to worry that you're going to make a movie and then whether you can sell it or not or make your investors their money back or not like it takes it takes that away and then you can just like enjoy making it i hate the process of financing so anything that will make that not have to be you how know. do you teach your how do you teach your students about about finding financing because so much of it to me seems you were talking before about the importance of relationships and building these relationships over time and holding on to the relationships that mattered to you when you were going to school how do you teach your students about finding you know just successfully finding financing finding those partners yeah, I mean, I say that I really impress upon them and it takes time, you know, like I didn't really, I feel like find financiers until the success of the writer, um, you know, but I, but I encourage them to go to the various different like markets that they can, they can, you can go to with independent films. There's the Gotham, we used to be IFP market, film independent has a, has a market called fast track. And so that way, like, you know, I went to all those that with with songs and never got any money from them. But then I I, I created I make those contacts then for future projects. Um, but I try and focus on like teaching them how to sell their project, like how to pitch it, how to mm-hmm. make a deck, how to find out what's what's the unique thing about your film that's going to make it stand out and make someone want to invest in you and your story. That's great. Um, do you do uh, do you do practice pitches in class? I don't. And I think it's a good idea. I should do that. Like with my interns, with uh, my company, we do uh, every couple of weeks, we have a call with them and they have to pitch one of the projects that they've covered, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, you. I really should do that because it's like, you just need to practice pitching. It's, you know, not, I don't find it necessarily the most fun thing to do, I guess, because it's part of the part of the part of financing, you know, that I don't like, yeah, sure. but it's definitely like a skill that needs to be flexed and, yeah. Um, okay. Alan asks, Alan says, speaking of bad scripts, have you ever come across one that you would have liked to change in order to make a quote, good film? I mean, yeah, I've definitely come across scripts that I feel like um, if they were to focus on a different character, it might have been more interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. But um, but when that happens, I think it's like, it's clear that I have a different vision of that story than that person if I'm wanting to like focus it on someone else in their story. But yeah, I, I, I find that often actually that I'll get scripts and I'm like, why are you focusing on that person? This other person is so much more interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
the uh, we're, we're getting close to you've given me so much of your time tonight. Um, does anybody else have any? We do have another question. Okay. Trying to stay on top of these a little better. Hang on. Another question for Molly. This will probably be our last one. Um, oh, how has this success? I mean, because this is, you know, there are people who enjoy success, meaning they're actually able to make a living at what they're doing. And then there are people who have won Academy Awards. So how does this, mm -hmm. how does this level, how is this level of success, um, uh, Dan asked, change your life either personally or professionally or, or both? We'll see. I'm not sure yet. Um, I have a very big, heavy uh, paperweight and we'll see if it's, um, people answer my phone calls more or, you know, maybe we'll see what, what different kinds of projects come my way. But um, yeah, I don't know how it'll change it. I just, I, it, it did, does just feel gratifying that like, to be that, that like these weird movies that we make can be, you know, acknowledged and appreciated with a broader audience. Um, By a, so. a massively, I mean, a massively broad audience. Um, uh, and how nice to share that with someone you've known since you were students together as well. Yeah. Um, and then to say to those, those, those financiers that said there was no audience, be like, guess you were wrong. <laughs> 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 oh my gosh. Um, I, I, I like that. I, and I think it's so, I mean, you said earlier in this discussion, and I think it's a good thing to, to end with is, is just don't wait for permission. And, uh, if you believe in something, you, you gotta keep going with it. There's, there are so many, there's so many stories where people didn't get the money they wanted, or, you know, people were told this, this, you know, wasn't going to fly. And uh, then the next thing you know, you have a movie like Nomadland that we are also happy exists in this world. Mm -hmm. um, so yay, and <laughs> and yay for for not waiting for permission. And um, thank you so much. Thank you for, for coming coming over and talking about all this all this sort of stuff. Um, I enjoyed I, I, it. I just, yes, I'm glad. And we have put a bunch in the. Um, we have put a, a bunch in the sidebar here. Joe lurking under my little uh, <laughs> my little icon head over there uh, about everything from uh, you know the the recipe, which will go in the recap, okay. and uh, all of Molly's films. And uh, this will also be up on uh, YouTube once I get it edited and, and cleaned up a little bit. And the recap will have all sorts of good information. Um, next on craft, uh, we are going to have Courtney Lilly, the showrunner and executive producer of Blackish and Mixedish. Cool. That will be lots of fun. Yeah. And, um, you know, everybody who's out there that has, you know, questions, you can either, you know, continue to put them in here or, uh, shoot me an email via my website. Go watch all of Molly's films. Um, and I can't, I'm looking forward to june 13th i might have to bop up to new york for tribeca i don't know that might be a fun little little trip to make um i'm really there's I'm also really tickets available virtual too oh real okay virtual tickets available too so we will definitely include information about tribeca film festival which is a wonderful festival i've been many times um and and molly's molly's premiere film and see the writer see songs my brother taught me uh, if you haven't seen Nomad Land, what's wrong with you? Go see it. Um, and uh, and thank you, and all of you who are who are writing, keep doing it. Uh, keep working with people you trust and care about. And uh, everybody, everybody, stay safe and be well. Thank you so much, Molly. Thank you. Bye, everybody.